Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Right Off the Bat Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Callan Thomas, and riding with me as always, we got Jim Darby. Darbs, how you doing today? Good day, Callan. Again, uh, another very, very interesting guest for us in Mike Fiore. So why don't you tell people a little bit about Mike? Yeah, Darbs, really exciting for us today. Mike Fiore, as you said, um, you know, college baseball royalty, uh, college baseball Hall of Fame member, class of 2014, uh, actually went into the same in the same class as one of our previous guests, Bill Bordley. We're going to talk to to Mike a lot about Omaha and and the great Miami teams he played for. Um, and, and Mike's just a baseball lifer, you know, played the game and is now heavily involved in the business of the game as a vice president at Boris Corporation. So we're just really excited to get his insights on you know, college baseball and, and how that plays in, in into professional baseball and, and how players get themselves ready. And then also, you know, hey, what's going on in our game? This pandemic has set just the economy and business into tailspin. And, and I think we're seeing some of that in baseball, uh, but it's coming back and, and we got to play and we got the World Series and, and spring training's coming. But I'm rambling. I am not the uh, the one people want to hear today. So, so Mike Fiore, Welcome to the show, and, and thanks so much for joining us today. Alan Darbs, thanks for having me. Boy, what a what a great opportunity to sit and catch up and talk about college baseball and baseball in general. So, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of it, and I'm thrilled to, to be on the show. But before we get going, I got to tell you, all of it depends depended on this baby right here. <laughs> the, the reason the reason I'm sitting here is this bat right here changed my life forever. And uh, in the record books because of this great product that was that was available to me in the 80s and let me tell you what a product it was. So well for, done for, to the people for, for all our all, all of our listeners out there who who don't have the visuals which Thank goodness, because you don't have to see any of the three of us. Mike is referring to the Green Easton uh, that has made its debut in the late 70s and was a staple of Omaha through the 80s and is, is back today. But just a, a quick um, rundown on Mike. So, so Mike, you played at the University of Miami from 1985 to 88, won a national championship in 85, all-tournament team in 1986. You are the very first ever winner of the Dick Hauser Trophy, which is now synonymous with the best player in college baseball year in and year out. Um, so a really storied career. Um, what what was and 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 I I don't want to fail to mention um, a, a a very big giver back to the University of Miami now in baseball. We've talked about that several times, and and just a big supporter in general of the game, but. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about your college baseball experience and, and playing for Coach Fraser and going to Omaha and all the good stuff? Well, that's that's a loaded question. We could probably talk a long time, but I want to I want to back up a little bit before I got to the University of Miami because uh, we moved to my my family and I, my mother, uh, re we relocated to Miami when I was like 13, 14. And I went to my first college baseball game uh, ever uh, at the light. It was between uh, number one, uh, uh, South Carolina at the time, and number two, Miami. And I walked into Mark Lake Stadium, and I'm telling you, I was mesmerized. 13 years old, and I and I sat back and I said to myself, "Oh my gosh, I want to be a part of this." Um, Miami had uh, Sam Sorcy and and Nelson Santavania and um, uh, Billy Rona and. Phil Lane and they just had they just had this like just I had never seen anything like it. I've been to big league baseball before and I had been to a minor league baseball game, but there was literally five thousand people at this game. And and you know at the time Miami didn't have the only pro sport it had was the, the Miami Dolphins. So college college sports and particularly the University of Miami sports were huge and they were well supported. I walked into the stadium and I was like, man, if I could be a part of this, it would be incredible. So we moved. Uh, went to Carl Gables High School and, um, um, you know, was a catcher at the time coming out of out of high school and uh, walked into um, walked into a um, into a situation where I got recruited to Miami. Uh, Jerry Weinstein, who was the coach at the time, um, well renowned uh, coach, both in pro and college sports, mostly a lot of it uh, is back in those days at Sac City College in Sacramento, won several national championships. He was at Miami. 
he saw me catch. He went down to see another guy, saw me catch, and I had a big night. The next day I was offered a scholarship at the University of Miami. And, um, you know, boy, I couldn't sign the scholarship fast enough and play for the legendary coach, Ron Frazier, and fulfill that dream that I, that I saw back uh, when I was 13 to be a part of something that was certainly a lot bigger than me, but something that was uniquely special, a neat, unique brand of baseball, and something that was just really coming onto the horizon. I think a year later, um, Miami won an at the first national championship in 82. And, um, you know, I was, a, I was in high school at the time, a junior in high school, and I just thought, wow, you know, what, what, what this program symbolized and what it could be. And um, then, of course, you know, uh, after getting my scholarship and going there, being able to be a part of some incredible college baseball teams and playing for Ron Frazier, who really changed my life. Um, and, and not so much in the baseball part of the life, but just gave me a perspective to think about things differently. Uh, he knew that baseball was, would be a foundation for, uh, for players, but it was not going to be ultimately what, you know, what the rest of their life was going to be. And he really taught, he taught um, baseball or he taught life through baseball as opposed to baseball through life. And, uh, but really gave us the foundation. And I'm, I'm so thankful that I had those opportunities to go and be a part of, in which I believe, you know, changed the foundation of my life and allowed me some of the successes that I've had, um, not only, as you mentioned before, the Olympics, but now in my professional career, um, none of that in my mind would have, would have even uh, been remotely possible if it wasn't for Ron Frazier. You know, Mike, it, it's interesting you mentioned that era because um, Frazier is known, obviously a great coach, but he was kind of an innovator for college baseball. You know, college baseball... Uh, even in the Dato years at SC, it was just baseball. But Fraser took it to a marketing level that it had never seen before. And I think, you know, for you growing up there and seeing that had to be such an advantage. It was. You know, it was, you know, going to, to go into Mark Light Stadium on a weekend, Friday, Saturday, and there were day games on Sunday. But it, there was always, you know, there was a cash giveaway. There was always some extravaganza going on at the ballpark. There was always a promotion. And I, I'm going to tell you a funny story that he that he that I will will remain with me forever. But um, you know he was he was always finding ways to get people to be comfortable. And and you know two things back back when I was in in college my freshman year uh, there was no limit on the number of games that you could play. So that season in 1985, the spring season, we played 80 games in in the spring. And um, which was so demanding. I mean, I can't even begin to, to talk to you about, you know, trying to finish school and do all these things. But prior to that, like in the fall, when I went in my freshman year, my fall, that we played 40 games in the, in the fall. And, you know, so he was he he really, you know, he was a great baseball coach. He understood baseball. But the one thing about Frazier, he wanted to make the program unique and he wanted to make it special. And to your point, Darbs, is that we were on Sunday night baseball on ESPN far before major league baseball was on Sunday night baseball on ESPN college baseball was, and for him to get ESPN. And again, different eras, hard to measure both eras because ESPN was in, in its infancy as well. And they were looking for program, but to, to, to be able to televise the college baseball back then, that was incredible. And that was what Frazier always wanted to do. Take it to a next level. Um, the program at the University of Miami when I was in school, as it, you know, as it is today, as will a lot of the college baseball programs, we, they fly everywhere. There's very few bus trips. There's, you know, we were treated uh, in, in like, like we were in the big leagues. And um, that's why so many players wanted to go there and, and, and have a chance to win. But the story that I wanted to share with you both, which was so, so much fun is we're playing Florida state. And I'm telling you, there's probably 8,000 people there at the stadium, standing room only big rivalry. And I'm on third base and somehow, you know, it's either Richie Lewis or, or Mike Loin pitching two great college baseball players. And you had, um, you know, they, they had Luis, Luis Adesaya, Bien Figaro, Mike Martin. They had, they just had, those were classic matchups back in those days. And, um, and Paul Sorrento was on FSU in those days. And I get to third base and I'm thinking, this is a really important run. It's probably the seventh inning. And, uh, and, uh, and I get to third base and I'm thinking, okay, I gotta, 
tag on a fly ball. I got to look for a pass ball, look for a ball in the dirt, make sure the ball gets past the pitcher if I'm going to score. And, and I'm waiting for Frage to kind of walk up and tell me what he wants to do. Am I going on contact or what, what's the circumstances? And sure enough, he whispered, he comes up to my ear and he gets me in my ear and he says, Hey Mike, how many hamburgers and hot dogs do you think we sold tonight? <laughs> <laughs> he, he wasn't even thinking about the run. He was thinking about how much money the program was making. And, um, but you know, he, he was in, in addition to, um, you know, he was, he was a, he was a pioneer in athletics. I mean, just at the University of Miami alone, what he did for the athletic department, what he did for college baseball on a grand scale, guys like Skip then taking from there and many other great college coaches embarking and building these, like, you know, some of these phenomenal stadiums that are, that are in college baseball today, whether it's at Arkansas or Old Miss or, you know, Texas or even some of the schools out in California. I mean, they're just, they're, it's, it's a real credit to so many of those coaches and in, in, in whether it be Ron Polk or Skip Burton or, and certainly Ron Frazier, because Ron really understood how to um, put his, not only his teams in places have a chance to win, but really college baseball as a whole have a chance to win. And he did that. He, he was the pioneer. He really was. No question. No question. He was. So, and, 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 you know, that's, that's obviously lasting. I mean, you think of the iconic programs in college baseball and while the game is really, really good now, and there's a lot of competitive teams there, there are a few of those logos that are truly iconic and, and coach Frazier's done that for Miami. Um, so you go there, you get this awesome, you know, experience playing there in Miami, but then you do go to Omaha several times and, and you performed super well there. And I know you mentioned, you know, off air, you've, you've been gracious enough to listen to a couple of our shows and, and hear us talk about Omaha. What was your experience with Omaha and, and what does Omaha mean and symbolize for you to this day? Well, you know, for me personally, uh, Omaha means a, a level of excellence that uh, as a college baseball player that you achieve that um, just getting there is, you know, is something that uh, is hard enough to do. Um, and, and whether, no matter what the format is, whatever the circumstances, getting to Omaha was different. But what, rep what, rep what Omaha represents, I think, to college baseball is beyond just what's played on the field. It's a symbolism of Americana. It's symbolism of the great balance between college athletics and, and, and winning and losing. Um, it represents community. It represents a fundamental place where you go, where a championship's held and people have such an esteem for that championship that they continue to support like they have over the years. So, I mean, you know, when I went first, went my first, I went my freshman year and we won the championship my freshman year. And I started, uh, I think we played 80 games. I think I missed two games uh, over the course of not starting in, um, at Miami that year. And uh, when we got there, um, Ron, who was, who was as good a promoter, a psychologist as he was a promoter, because he basically got his teams to really play because we were, we were the eighth ranked team in the country. Uh, or seed, if you will, when we got to Omaha, we went up against Stanford, who was the number one seed, and Jeff Ballard was the number, you know, first round pick. Um, anyway, we we go through uh, and we win the first game. Uh, we beat Stanford. Uh, I want to say sixteen to four or five, something like that. It was a blowout, and um, but the aura around that that ballpark, and not only when you're playing, but you go when you go to like dinners or you go to you know, the zoo, or you go to some of the other major attractions. We went to the SAC base there and uh, which they treat the players just tremendously. There's so much community involved in Omaha, but the energy that's around the, the tournament and the players and people is just amazing. I mean, they literally come out and they root not only always for the best team, but just the team that they love or they pick or they, they find unique. And, um, uh, of course, then we go to the second the second game and we get we get we get beat by uh, uh, Texas and we go into losers bracket and we have to work our way back out and end up playing Mississippi State with Pete and Covilia and beat them 
on the low scoring uh, affair, which I think was two to one or three to two. Uh, come out of that, go beat Mississippi State that had Brantley, Thigpen, Palmero, and Clark. And you, when you said in Kavila, you meant Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State, yes. Right. I'm sorry. Right. We beat Oklahoma State in the, in the first game of the loser bracket. Um, and then we had to face Mississippi State with those first four round players in it. And um, we win on a walk off home run by Greg Elena, who is a walk on bullpen catcher and hits a home run. And we win that game. Then go on, we have to go beat Texas twice, uh, which we did. Greg Swindell and then Mike. Mike, Mike Pell, I think it was, uh, was, was the pitcher uh, in the second night. Uh, several rain delays in between the first and second game. I think there were two nights that were rained out that we ended up playing. So we had to, we had to wait a couple of days. But, you know, the, we were talking about Omaha and, you know, just the uniqueness, like the hotels. There's multiple teams staying in multiple hotels. So you, you get to meet a lot of different players from around the country and you share different experiences and, you know, I, I think it's the best, I mean, I'm, I'm biased and I know I'm biased, but I think it's the best championship in, in sports. And the reason I feel that way is that, you know, the college football playoff is fantastic, but to me, it's not as inclusive as, as it should be. There should be more teams. Um, and that's a function of a lot of different things, but Omaha, you're getting, you're getting 64 teams pared down to eight and you're getting the best eight teams in the country and what an affair it is. And again, it goes back to not only, you know, baseball, but a sense of community, a sense of, of, of championship and a sense of camaraderie that is, is really hard pressed to find anywhere else. And that's why I think it's so great. It's so balanced. And if it was up to me, I think, uh, you know, in the, in the planners in Omaha, I think it, uh, they should sign a lifetime deal there because it's, it's that important. It's that ingrained, and it's, it symbolizes excellence in college baseball that I don't think you could find anywhere else in any other sport. Um, there are great cities, and don't get me wrong, there's great cities in the United States that could host championships. But base, college baseball is so synonymous with, with, with Omaha that it'd be an injustice in my mind that if it was ever moved or put somewhere else, because I just don't think um, it would have the same symbolism of what it does today. So obviously we we missed out on it this year with the – pandemic but what is your take on major league baseball kind of finally embracing omaha now as well and and understanding its significance in the college game and and, and moving the major league draft to omaha now and and looking to really tie college baseball and major league baseball i feel closer together do you, do you like that or do you think it it takes away from the college experience or is it good to just make it a more holistic event? Well, I have mixed feelings on that, part, partly because MLB, look, Major League Baseball is a tremendous, you know, brand of baseball. The best players in the world play in Major League Baseball. And the, basically the feeder system for, you know, college or per, pardon me, for Major League Baseball is college baseball. If you look at the success, success rates of players playing in the big leagues, there's certainly, you know, your chances of succeeding in, in professional baseball are far greater if you go to college versus if you go to high from sign out of high school. Uh, and there's a multitude of reasons for that. Um, that being said, um, it, 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 it's the feeder system. I mean, you're getting the multi, you're getting these type of players, I think, and I don't know, this is a little speculation on my part. It's not, you know, real fact, but I think when you, when you start to bring outside influences, um, I think it's great for, for Major League Baseball because it's, it's efficient, but I do think it takes a little away from the championship because everybody's not going to play professional baseball. So the idea of what the championship means, I think, should stand alone. Uh, I think it's, it, 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 would be, it would be taking a little bit of it away, but at the same time enhancing it. So, you know, because you get you get so much visibility through Major League Baseball and what the draft would be. So I think it helps. I just think it has to be measured. And I think it has to be make sure that it just doesn't come in and stampede the idea of what the championship represents. Do you, do you think it, it appears Major League Baseball is dropping the number of minor league teams? Uh, indication that college baseball is becoming more like college football as the minor league for MLB? I, I think so, Darbs. I think you're 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 right on. I think the uh, the 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 condensing of minor league baseball um, and what 
college baseball will rep represent, I think it, it's, it's going hand in hand because you're going to see the development of college baseball. Once minor league baseball, you know, the, once it, once it figures that once we get through the pandemic and we really see what minor league baseball is going to look like, um, you know, cause I think there's still a lot of unknowns of what that's going to look like. Um, even for 2021, we don't know what that's going to look like. We don't know how many clubs or how many players or how many teams are going to be in minor league affiliates. <clears throat> that's still up in the air, but what college baseball certainly can, can do is be an anchor for, uh, a lot of that development. And I, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping just like, I think you are too, that that foundation is um, enhanced because, you know, this should not every, you know, professional sports is, is, is great. It's a great environment. It's a great, it, 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 you know, obviously uh, baseball's given me, given me a lot of different things personally, but I think when you look at the standard of what pro sports is, um, everyone's not going to play in the big leagues. You know, the average career of, of playing in the big leagues is less than three years. And that's it. That's it. That's the reality of pro sports. I mean, it's just, it's short lived and as good as it is, I mean, guys that play 20 years in the big leagues, they're less than 1%. It's just a, it's just not a tough, it's, it's a tough play. So the turnover is just amazing. So what do you want to do? You want to get players that are educated. You want to get players that have been taught well, the development as well, and they end up being really good players. So where you just see that and mostly in college baseball, because the teaching element of what college baseball represents, teaching of the game, the situations, all those things, if minor league baseball is going to be condensed and, and shortened and somehow, you're going to have to look to college baseball to fill that void. And I think that's where we could be heading. Um, we could be heading to more of a college football look in the development of, uh, and that'd be great for college baseball in my mind. It would just be fantastic. Well, and, and what's funny about this, and this is probably a, an entirely different conversation, but Mike, you probably know this pretty well, but a bunch of uh, my friends, Darb's friends from the college ranks, um, Major League Baseball has been plucking them up the last couple of years to come be pitching coordinators and hitting coordinators. And it's, I think Major League Baseball is looking for the teaching that goes on in college baseball because at that level you really have to coach uh, major league baseball. The guys, a lot of them come developed. A lot of them, you, they have to develop through the system, but um, we, we kind of fast forwarded here and I want to go back to your, your days in college and, and you already threw out some really impressive names, but I think college baseball is always good, but you were in Omaha in such a, a golden era. And I'm looking at the 19, 88 Olympic team roster. And I'm just, these names are all triggering Omaha to me as well. When you look at Robin Ventura and Ed Sprague, who won a couple of championships and Ben McDonald, number one overall pick. What was it like? You, you, you play against some of these great players. You, you mentioned all the Mississippi state guys and, and you know, the Oklahoma state guys, but then you get the opportunity to go play in the Pan Am games and then stay on that international team in, in 88 and, and go play for your country. Um, what was that like playing against these guys and then being teammates and, and then going from a, a stage in the Midwest America and to the world stage with the Olympics? <clears throat> yeah. When I, when I, uh, when I got asked to uh, try out for the 87 team, I mean, I was, I was blown away with the names that were, that were going to be at this, at this workout, you know, these tryouts for a month. And Frazier was the team and uh, coach of the team in 87. So um, going into there, you know, I met, you know, Eddie Sprague and Tino Martinez and Robin Ventura. And, you know, these guys have become friends for a lifetime, you know, but the talent level was just off the charts. I mean, off the charts, good. And um, of course, you know, two years removed, a lot of these guys, they were asking about, you know, what was it like to play in Miami? What was it like to play in the College World Series? Because some of them had played and some of them maybe had, did, had, did, had not played. And Tino Martinez coming from like a division two college um, had a different, totally different experience than some of the guys that were playing division one, but one of the best players in the country. And I have to tell you, Callan, I got to tell you, and I mean this as humbly as I could say it, Miami had some great players. They had really some really talented guys like that 85 national championship team. Not one player played in the big leagues, not one. 
and it was a champion. Really good players. But when I got to the international level, I mean, it was like it was like jumping from a ball to the big leagues. I mean, it was they, they were that good. They were that good. Like Robin Ventura, just the swing, the sw just a swing, smooth, sw you know, effortless swing. Tino, the same thing. These guys had real skill. But the thing that I took away from it was I got to I got to talk to them about what made them successful. And, you know, what was their approach like, or what did they do? And man, it really, it, it, it helped me more than I could ever tell you. Like just facing some of these guys, Chuck Nagy, Jim Abbott, Ben McDonald, Andy Bennis, uh, Mike Milchin, uh, Joseph. Joe, Joe, Joe Susarski. Yeah. Joe Susarski. Yeah. I mean, nasty, nasty guys. I and mean, we were facing these guys in inner squad and I was just hoping to get a hit in one of one or four pass. They were that good. Um, but, you know, when I think about the people and the players, when I think about how talented they were, but the one thing I take away from every one of them, and I, I start at the top with a guy like Eddie Sprague or, or Jimmy Abbott, these people were winners. And Ron Frazier used to say to me all the time, a lot of people talk about winning. Few people know how to do it. Because everybody talks about how to win, but few people do it. And the thing that I take away from all my teammates on the international level they knew how to win. They knew when to win. They knew what they had to do to win. And they knew how to prepare to win. And they executed to win. And that's the thing that I would take away from all these guys. Like, you think about Ed Sprague. He's a two-time NCAA champion in baseball. He's a Olympic gold medalist in baseball. And he won the World, Major League World Series twice with the Toronto Blue Jays. Yeah. No, there, 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 there's a pattern. There's a pattern on that's every one of the, those guys. Yeah. And, and, and the coaching staff. See, that's the other oh. part of it, Mike. I mean, 87, when you were on the Pan Am Games and Ron was your head coach. Then you get to the 88 Olympic team and the you know World Baseball Championship team. And tell us about that coaching staff. Yeah. Well, if I may, I'm going to go back to 87 just briefly because that was the first team that had gone to Havana, Cuba in like 30 years. And for the listeners out there, the – Cuban baseball team was like the Russian hockey team in the eighties. Um, they, they seldom lost in any international competition. They had, um, you know, state sponsored professionals, essentially. Uh, we were college kids. I was 20 years old going down to Cuba. First Americans in Cuba since 1959 and uh, Fidel Castro, legendary leader of, uh, of Cuba uh, takes us down there and we go down there and it was, you know, it was, a, that was a real learning experience. But the one thing that I take away, we walked into Latino Americana stadium in Havana and it was packed 50,000 people and they're playing their bongos and they're doing their music. And it's, and I remember, I remember um, Frazier, you know, basically saying to all of us, you could tell that something was different about the, this night because when we walked in, there was a lot more security. So I had a feeling that somebody big was going to be there. And sure enough, Castro came and Castro uh, came on the field and, and Frazier said to us, we're not going over to greet him. Now there's a little bit of political element to what he had to say because Frazier and myself grew up in, you know, we were growing up in Miami. So there was a, you know, you know, the politics in Miami, it was not favorable for, for, uh, uh, Fidel, you know, you don't want to support him. You don't even want to seem like you were even close to supporting him. So Frazier said, we stay here. The Cuban team ran over to him, embraced him. He said, we're staying here. He can come to us. And he did. And, uh, he came on the field and, uh, you know, big moment. I mean, this is, this guy's a political, huge political leader. Um, and, um, uh, he came on the field and he said, you know, while our countries have major differences in um, in how we view things, both politically uh, and philosophy, um, our people do share the love of sport, culture and music. And while you're here on the island, I hope that you find uh, the island to be as beautiful as the people here. And uh, if there's anything that you need, um, please don't hesitate. I want you to enjoy your stay here. And more importantly, I want you to play great baseball. That was what he said. That was the message. He, he then spoke to Jim Abbott for a little bit because um, he wanted to meet Jim um, and, uh, you know, see the pitcher with one hand and uh, off he went. But the thing afterwards that got me was several of my teammates, we all came together and he said, look, we're going to win tonight. We're going to win tonight. And we have to win tonight. We, were, we had lost the first two games 
uh, to Cuba down there with seven game series and said, we're going to win tonight. And we're going to, we're going to, and, and that was what struck me about my teammates was that these guys had a sense of not only, you know, I mean, you can talk about pride, American pride, Americanism, patriotism, whatever you want to talk about, but they had an essence of we're going to win tonight and we're going to show the world that we can be as spectacular as, as we are. And a uh, bunch of college kids, you know, we ended up losing the series four games to three, but I think we put, put not only the best team on the world on notice, but I think we did um, really well for international baseball. And that jump started in 87 to what uh, 1988 ended up being. And that was winning the gold medal and touring the world uh, all over in Japan, uh, you know, uh, in Italy and, and, and then of course, all over the United States as well. So um, my teammates on the 88 team, and I say this to a person, to a man, what a bunch of winners those guys were. A um, bunch of leaders, um, forget about, I mean, great talented baseball players. And I think the record will speak for that. But I think one of the things that I take away from and looking back at all those people uh, and my teammates and the experiences that I had with them, they were all winners and they all were ready to play. And you, there was no doubt you could tell that everybody was gonna have a lot of success, uh, not only at the moment, but in the future as well. That's awesome. Awesome, and, awesome experiences, man. Yeah. And, and I think, um, I think te people today might look back and still take that for granted a little bit because now, you, now we see Cubans playing major league baseball and we see players coming over from Japan, but, but back then that didn't happen. And you guys were great ball players, but you're, you're basically just out of college, 20 years old playing professional teams from other countries, just the way that their, their governments were set up and whatever. And, uh, I, I remember even as a kid thinking how, how cool that was because, you know, Cuba was talked about with such esteem as a baseball nation, but they weren't allowed to come play against major leaguers. Everybody knew that they were more than capable of it, you know, at least several of them. And now we see it today, but, um, that's so cool. And, and you're talking about your teammates as winners, Right, Mike, let's, way, let's, count, let's count, throw count, you in one, there because you count, hold on, Jim. What? I'm trying to give him a compliment. And you're cutting me off. I'm trying. He's to, got it. He's got enough compliments. <laughs> he's the guy. He's calling his teammates winner. You won a national championship and a gold medal too. So you know, well, put yourself in that uh, category. That, but that's what I was about to get to, though, because one great memory for me of '88 when you guys were playing in the uh, in Italy, um, I saw a film clip recently of you getting a big hit against Cuba against a guy named Rene Orocha. Yeah. And you talk about pros. Rene Orocha went on to become the first defector from Cuba to pitch in the big leagues. Yes. And, and you yeah. got a banging double off of him. So, dude, like Callan just said, we got to give you your due, too. You know, I, I, I will say, you know, my experiences in, 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 in baseball in general were fantastic. Those two summers – um, you know, and my, you know, my experience as amateur, amateur baseball was just off the charts, but, you know, to your point about the people that were on that team and the players, and I appreciate the compliments both of you have given me because I loved playing. I loved it. I loved competing and I loved playing. And when you were going up against the best, um, and I'm sure, you know, this is true. There's, there's nothing in life that will ever, ever be able to replicate pitcher versus a batter. In my mind, there's nothing. There's nothing like it. When you step in the box and you're you're facing a great pitcher or a player, you know to be able to have that and to rely on on what your preparation is, your mental outlook on things, and your ability to succeed. That one on one matchup, I don't care what form it is in, it that is it. It is it to me. That was the best part of it. And you know, you're talking about the Cuban national team a little bit. Um, Guriel, you see the Guriel brothers. Their father was unbelievable, uh, maybe the best player in Cuba. Luis Casanova, maybe, you know, one of the greatest Cuban players ever. Victor Mesa, uh, just a nut, a nut of a player, but a great talented player, but, you know, and he's a manager now. Um, and Omar, you know, I'm just naming a few, but you know, there were so many great Kinderlins. Oh, no, oh, nobody was better than Omar Linares. Omar Linares, the, the best baseman. player, best player, Jim, I agree with you, 100%, best player I've ever seen. He was 18 years old yeah. and he was the best player I've ever seen and never left Cuba. You know, he was a loyalist, a loyalist 
and uh, never left Cuba, never went to anywhere else to play, but, or maybe he played in Japan a little bit, but literally never played in the States and would have been by far one of the greatest players in, in, in big league baseball. So awesome. S such cool history there. And, and just, uh, you know, again, we take for granted the amateur game in, in the States a little bit because everybody wants to look at major league baseball and the impact that it has. But during this whole time, you're obviously doing some networking as well while you're playing because let's fast forward a few years, your, your playing career, um, you know, finishes up, you had very successful. And then you go work for USA baseball for a little bit. Was that through connections that you had made while playing for, for the national team or, or how did you end up at USA baseball then? I, I ended up in USA baseball. I was uh, the player rep uh, for the um, board of directors at USA baseball. And uh, it so happened that um, I was going up for a meeting. And uh, when I, when I stopped playing, um, I actually was considering uh, some things in law enforcement. Um, I had a friend in my, in Miami, and he had pursued, um, he asked me, he, he had a son and he came to Miami games all the time. He said, you know, he brought me this beautiful picture and I still have it of Joe DiMaggio, uh, 1939 of Joe DiMaggio. It's one of those pictures where the photographer got up real close on, like during the game. And, and it's a beautiful picture. It's signed by Joe DiMaggio. And he said, I want to give this to you as a gift because you did so much during your playing days at Miami. So when I stopped playing, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I went back to Miami and I considered going back to grad school, law school and, uh, and business school. And um, he came to me and he said, you know, I, I'm, I want you to consider a, a job in law enforcement. I work in the Secret Service. And uh, would you ever consider this? And I was like, sure, I'll, you know, of course, I'll consider it, you know. And uh, so I went through the whole the whole thing, the testing. I went through, uh, but it, at the time, the government was not hiring new employees. Uh, they were, we were, you know, I think Clinton administration was going on and uh, they had basically put a freeze on hiring government employees. So I had the drug test, I went to physical test, took the, the whole test. I was just waiting basically to go on and, and, and go on to this new chapter in my life. Well, I get a call from the USA Baseball Board of Directors saying that they're going to have a meeting, they'd like me to come. And so I, they asked me, what have you been doing? And I said, well, I'm going to go into this. Well, the gentleman who was who preceded me in running the national teams was leaving. And they had asked me, would you ever consider putting your name in for the job? And I had no practical experience at the time other than my playing experiences and associations in the game. And so I dug into it a little further and I said, sure, I'm going to I'm going to put my name in for it. And uh, sure enough, I, I ended up getting the job. I did an interview and I got the job and uh, was at USA Baseball for the, the next five, almost five and a half years um, of, you know, from my transition as a player into my executive life. And, uh, you know, it couldn't work out any better for me. I met my wife at USA Baseball and, uh, you know, many, many wonderful things came out of it, but it gave me a chance to really dabble into on the, you know, the executive side, the business side of it. And uh, where, you know, I served uh, in that capacity, which was something that was just as valuable for me because I got to really understand more of the, of the, you know, the amateur side of how a business is run, even though we were a nonprofit, how that ran and what needed to be done to really support the programs the way we wanted it to be done. So that was invaluable to me. And just by a stroke of luck, really, I got the job. And then, so you, you're on the 88 team as a player. What, what was your role going forward with the, the national team, the Olympic team? Like, did you have a hand in the 92 team, for example? And no, I didn't. So when I stopped, you know, I got drafted in 88 and then uh, I played professionally from 88 to 92. And then uh, when 92, I, I got released in the, in the fall of 92, uh, the Olympics were basically over. So there was a, there was like maybe 16, 18 months uh, difference between the 92 team and then preparation for the 96 team. And again, we go back to, you know, once I got the job, really started preparing for Atlanta and what that meant for the U S national team. And of course, 
um, built yet a build up for that. And one of the ways that we really felt we wanted to do that was getting a core group of young players. Um, after the 92 team was over, we had a, um, we had a work, basically a fall trial. We brought a hundred of the top players, amateur players into Homestead, Florida in the fall of, of 92 in preparation of, of trying to see what the 96 team would look like. And we had guys like AJ Hinch was part of that group and, and Casey Blake was part of that group and Braden Looper was part of that group, group Travis Lee, Jock Jones. Mark, so those Mark, guys, yeah, Mark Kotze. Too. Mark Kotze was all part of that. They all came in four years, you know, basically, you know, uh, four years, three and a half years before the 96 Olympics and started working out. We started building towards the crescendo of what 96 would be to really form a team. We really wanted to get some international competition, players to have international competition. Again, and going back to what the model of, let's say, Japan and or Cuba was, um, we needed, we, they needed experience. They were talented. We, they, we, U.S. never suffers from talent. Talent is always there. But what we, you know, an essential, why, why do guys go to the minor leagues? They go to the minor leagues <clears throat> to be able to repeat what, they, what their talent allows them to do. It's all about repetition. It's all about building that, that confidence and understanding. What, what makes great pros is experience. Great minds. That's what makes great pros. Talent is a given, right? You have to have talent. You won't be, you wouldn't be drafted if you didn't have talent. Talent is the, the easiest thing to identify in my mind. What's the hardest thing to identify is someone's, you know, their attitude, their commitment to themselves, their ability to, you know, really become a pro. A pro in my mind is really a per person that understands themselves. So if you can give them that experience and give them that foundation, that's what I thought was going to be most successful when we moved into 96. Give them all that international competition and then roll the dice in the games because you're playing one game for, for all the marbles and you hope it goes your way. It may not, but you hope it does. You know, it's fascinating when you think of 88, 92, 96, and you look at the – and this was when it was strictly amateur. By 2000 now, they allowed some minor league players to come in. But you look at the quality of those ball clubs – and you just mentioned some of the guys on the 96 team. You mentioned the 88 squad. How cool would it have been if you guys could have all played against each other? Oh, my God. I, I would have loved to have seen something like that. How, how Even going back to, like, 84, 84, 88, 92, 96, you know, put those, put those teams together and see what a, what a what player like a round robin, what that would have been like. Uh, you know, I mean, just – some brilliant, brilliant players that have, uh, you know, again, going back, what are, what are we really talking about? These are all college players, all of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was interesting. You were mentioning Linares before on the Cuban team. Well, you played against him in 88. Those same guys, Cuban guys, were playing against the 96 team in Atlanta. I know. So you wonder, you wonder what it was like trying to play against them when they're always together. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and, and that's the one thing that I think – you can never replicate because it's like, you know, you know what, you know what he's going to do that, you know, his tendencies, you know what he's going to do. He knows his abilities. And there was an inherent trust on those teams. They were always so confident because they knew no matter where they were, that experience, you know, they had more experience than anybody in the world. And I think that's the, that's the draw that you always want to have with players. But I'll, I'll tell you what, you go back to these college teams and you put them in as professionals and, you know, you, you start them as college, you go through the, you know, the professional ranks. I'd love to see what, you know, if you took, if you took all those teams and you put them all together and they had to play each other, throw the Cuban national team in as well. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you some of these U.S. teams, based on all that experience they would have had, would have changed the paradigm really very differently. Just because we don't have the one thing, the, the edge that we didn't have that all those Cuban teams has were, were that international experience and the ability to play together. You know, we didn't, we didn't have that. And, uh, but it, it, I think it's a real testament to the talent of baseball in college, because again, all these players in 84, 88, 92, 96, they're all college players. All of them are college baseball players. Mike, you should, you should trademark this idea because with all the artificial intelligence now and video games and stuff, somebody's going to take this concept and, and this round robin that you're talking about. They're going to have these video games of these Virtu guys. Virtual games. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's awesome. And just 
You're right. When you put it in that perspective, like the U.S. is just never short of talent. And we could run through Omaha lists and college lists and pro lists. And just I'm still like, uh, you know, awestruck by by the names that are that are that are just listed off. But so you you, fin- you finish up your tenure with USA Baseball. And, you know, you're developing professionally now within the game, which I think is a dream of of all of us if you know I could never play the game but the the fact that I've been able to make a career in baseball blows my mind every day you take the next step and and, and learn more of the business of baseball moving on in, in the agency world going to Boris Corp and that started in in 97 correct November of 97 correct and November. and what spurred that transition for you so you know again as fate would have it, um, I was returning home. We were playing, uh, I was on the road for quite a bit in the, in the summer of 97 and had, uh, come out to Los Angeles to play in team Korea. And we were playing, uh, at USC. And if you can imagine the Korean community in Los Angeles, which is rather significant. And, um, they came out to support, uh, their national team and the place was packed. I mean, it was packed. So I have a, a, a colleague that I've worked with and pl- was a former teammate of mine uh, the summer prior to joining USA Baseball. I played in Alaska for the, um, As- uh, uh, the um, uh, Bucks. And, uh, and uh, I, another great summer of collegiate baseball and uh, Anchorage Bucks and uh, played up there in the summer. And a teammate of mine who played at San... Uh, at San Jose, um, not San Jose State, pardon me, Santa Clara University, uh, Scott Champarino um, had been working with Boris. And it so happened that they got to the game in Los Angeles and they couldn't get a seat because uh, there were so many people there. And so I got a call and I met them downstairs and ran into Champ and ran into Scott. They were both, uh, they were both attending the game and, and uh, we got to talking a little bit and, um, Basically, uh, let I let Champ know, uh, who was you know a good friend of mine, that I was probably leaving USA Baseball at that point. I was unsure about where I was going because I ha- I did have some opportunities going to professional baseball. Uh, Jim will remember this name, Oren Freeman, who um, was a was a really uh, wonderful man, and uh, he had opened uh, and suggested some opportunities in professional baseball for me, and I was considering those and. Uh, so when I, after Los Angeles, that game was over, I got them their seats and they got situated. A few days later, I got a call from Scott and uh, he said, uh, you know, look, um, uh, I'd like you to come to Los Angeles and, um, you know, to Orange County. And I'd like you to come spend a few days with me. And, and I want to tell you about what I'm going to do with my business and how I'm going to do it. And I told him at the time, look, I don't, I don't really think I want to get in the agency business. Um, and he just said, you know, why don't you come for just a couple days? I want to show you kind of where I think uh, things could go. Um, and, you know, um, my father who passed away a year ago and my parents, my parents, uh, are just tremendous, been tremendous resources in my life. Both of them said, you know, you have to, you have to go and explore this, whether you take it or not, you got to go explore it. And, uh, so I came to California and I met with Scott for like three days and he laid out a vision uh, you know, it's 23 years ago um, of what he wanted uh, for his company. And, um, and sure enough, I mean, it is pretty darn spot on if it, you know, what, he, what he had a vision for the company to be. And um, I knew right then when I met with him that that was a business opportunity for me that I couldn't, I couldn't turn down. And, um, you know, so I didn't necessarily agree on the spot, but in my brain I did. And I uh, went back and, you know, counseled with my family. And that was a big move for me because I, I was, I'm an East Coast guy and I was moving to California, um, not married. I just started dating my wife and uh, we were dating. We weren't, we weren't even married at the time. And now I'm going to pick up and move to California and, and into, a, in, into a world that I was really unfamiliar with. And, you know, I mean, it's baseball, but it's, it's different. And, um, but, you know, the challenge ahead for me was something that, you know, um, I, you know, I really believed in Scott, still believe in obviously what he does and, and the mantra of, of his, what he does for players. And, 
And uh, so it was a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. I'm very blessed to have been working in this business uh, as long as I have. And uh, I work, in my opinion, for the greatest uh, agency uh, that represents players. Uh, and it's the reason I say that it's, it's, it's beyond money. It's, it's about education. It's about growth. It's about self-understanding. And uh, I've learned all those things uh, and been able to pass it on to players um, in a, in a way that, you know, you hope that have changed people's lives. And, uh, to me, that's what, it, you know, an advisor is really all about a counsel to people to make good decisions. I've made my baseball decisions, right? So when I, when you're talking to a player, you want to, you want them to be able to make good decisions and good choices. And the way that you do that is through information. You mentioned before, I thought it was fascinating that the average career is three, three and a half years for guys who even make it to the big leagues. So I'm going to ask you the obvious question. Is it due to that fact and what you can teach your players about life? Is that why the Boris Corporation, you, Scott, and everybody who works there, why you guys are so successful? I, I, I think there's a, there's a, look, we, we, first of all, first and foremost, and I said this, uh, I've said it, I'll say it now. And I said it before is that we work with some incredibly talented people, but you know, they're, they're talented, talented people that are able to um, take their talents to a next level. But I always believe that, Jim, it's, it's, it's about when you're growing young people and you're growing them into what you want, to be, want them or they can become, it's, it's through information. It's through education. It's through, you know, in baseball, the, great, the greatest thing about baseball, in my mind, is that you fail a lot. And I'll say that again you fail a lot in baseball. And when you fail a lot, you understand that what, what the path you have to do to be successful. Because you, if you understand that you're gonna fail, you're then I'm gonna understand that the success that I have, that's how I prepare, that's what I'm going to prepare for. Not the failure, because the failure will overwhelm you. But the hardest part about our business, really in, in business, baseball in general, to your point about the career being three and a half years, it, or less than three and a half years is that you have injury takes you out of the game. Malperformance takes you out of the game. So what do you try to do to, to negate both those? And if you can build the foundation of, of information to get to a player to, to understand that it's not always about performance. It's an about approach number numbers. You know, you know, we, we all play the game. So the numbers go like this. They all do. And that's why they call it a career because you're going to have peaks and valleys of performance. Baseball, if you play baseball over the course of six months, you're going to have a lot of success and some, you're going to have some failure. It just happens to every player. It's not, you know, there's not one player that I know that didn't have failure. So how do you manage that? How do you manage yourself? How do you get to the point where you can deal with, you know, that, that plateau of, of how to deal with that failure. And I think really it's about, educating. I think a lot of people in our business, or at least the connotation, oh, you're an agent, you're an agent. Well, it's really about growing people. It's about giving them information to make good decisions and good life choices. And, you know, if you do that, then I think you're going to find somebody that's very successful. I, I had the, the, I've had the, the privilege, and I mean this, I mean this as since with the most sincerity that I could say, I've worked with some unbelievable people and have learned so much from unbelievable people from Greg Maddox's to Barry Bonds to Adrian Beltre to Matt Holiday. You know, you name the player and I'll, 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 you know, how fortunate I was to listen to what made them successful. Jason Veritek or um, because talent alone will not get you where you want to be. It just doesn't, it can't. And uh, the few exceptions that, that, that really have the ability to play for a long time, but like Adrian Beltre was, was telling me a story one time we were talking, we were in the dugout in Oakland and we were talking about, you know, early on in his career, he was, he, you know, people said he never lived up to the expectation of what he should be. And, you know, he had 240, 230, um, you know, 250 and, you know, hit 25 home runs, drove in 90, pretty good, pretty good numbers. But people always said, there's more there, there's more there. And, you know, he had a huge year, his sixth year in the big leagues where he, you know, he was second in the MVP at 120 RBIs, 36 home runs, you know, hit 340. And 
then he, you know, he guy played 18 years in the big leagues. You play 18 the big years in the big leagues, you're doing something right. Not just performance wise, but he posted every day. He played every day. He, he went to the ballpark every day. So I asked him, I said, you know, how do you, we were talking just like, what is your mental outlook on things? And he said, you know, I realized one thing that if I'm going to get 600 plate appearances or 700 plate appearances over the course of the season, I play 150 games. I'm going to make a lot of outs. So I have to then teach myself how to find the productivity and, you know, and, and get, if I'm going to make, if I'm going to make outs seven out of 10 times, um, and, and I'm going to, then I have to concentrate on what I do with the three and make those really meaningful to me and understand that that pattern may change over the course of the time. And I'm going to be more successful over the course of 20 at bats or 30 at bats. And I would be at over 10, but he said, it's, it's really about posting every day. It's really about keeping myself durable. It's about keeping myself in, in, in getting myself to in that batter's box every day. And if I do that, I'm going to be successful. And here's a kid who had no college education, who made some great business choices along the way, um, but really understood what he did well. And that was be on the field every day. And 3,000 hits later um, really has made a difference uh, in his career in, in that approach. So to me, it's, it, you know, he came to the big leagues at 19 and not everybody's going to follow that path and everybody's going to have a different path. But the reality is, is the principles are the same. Education, durability, and information. You do that, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be very successful in this business. Because again, we go back to the talent level. Talent's never, you're not waning. If you're, if you're drafted, you're a decent player in this country. You're a good player. So, so Mike, I, um, again, just really insightful stuff here. But, you know, I, I want to speak to those people out there who they, they hear the word agent or, you know, see the business of baseball and, and all they think about is, um, you know, the Garrett Cole contract, $324 million or whatever it is. And, and they just see money. But, but what you said is so important. And I think we're around young baseball players, all of us a lot. And it, you said it's, it's, you know, the council and yes, obviously you want to make money, but who else is going to advocate for you other than yourself? But I want to go back to what you said about spending three days with with Scott Boris and, and the vision, because I look at your guys' agency and and I take a step back from baseball being a game and it, it's a hard business, but you said he was such a visionary. And when I think of you guys, I think of really being on the forefront of analytics, which you mentioned information and data. I, I think about... Um, I think about marketing and, and, and media and before social media is what it is today, a lot of what your guys players were doing. So it's not just about negotiating for as much money as you can get. Um, you know, what, what is that vi vision? And I feel like you guys are being innovative all the time. And, but is it also just, Hey, we're real with our guys and we have relationships. I mean, what, what all in cap in cap, encapsulates you as an agent, I guess. Well, that's, you know, it varies. I mean, the, 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 the answer for me is every player is going to be different. Every personality is different. Every, how you have to, to, to have touch points with different people, but, you know, really, you know, Scott's a, Scott is a really understands one thing about people and that is how to get them to do the, what they do well and repeat it. And once you're able to do that, you're going to find success or the player is going to help find success. The player has to just find himself. And how do you do that? You do it through a variety of different ways, but some of it is maturity. But listen, in this business, you're, you, you negotiate maybe 15, 20 percent of the time. You're, you're really trying to grow players the rest of the time and get them to a point of where they can really do that. And, and some players just, it takes longer to get to those, to that level, but um, of, of that self-understanding, it just takes a little longer, but you do it through information. You do it through data. Um, you do it through durability. Um, how do you, you know, you got to, if, 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 if a, I'm going to just, you know, make somebody up, but if Garrett Cole does, is not healthy enough to uh, reach um, free agency, then, you know, he's not going to have the ability to have the performance that he does in our business. 
in the business of baseball, you have to remember that one of the most important things that you can do is take care of yourself because the way the economics are, are in business, in the business of baseball, you're probably going to make, have the ability to make more money after 30 than you are before 30. So how do you keep yourself healthy? How do you do that? What do you do? What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you, what are you doing for yourself? You know, do you, do you go to your local gym and you train with a guy that does football or do you go to a local gym and work out with a guy that knows it has to keep you healthy for 162 games? So these are all the things that you have to invest in. And Scott has done that in his business. Scott has invested in, in, uh, Boer sports training, um, you know, um, where he has, you know, eight trainers, 10 trainers uh, full time to our players. We have two facilities, one in Miami, one in um, one in um, in Southern California. Um, you know, we we make that a commitment to our players to be able to do those things. We have a research staff of, you know, 25 people that that's all they do full time. And they're they're from the greatest at universities, you know, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, MIT. I mean, these guys, Cal, 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 Cal of yeah, course, Cal. we have, Cal. We, have a, we have a couple of attorneys from Cal. I want you to know. <laughs> you know, Mike, what, what, uh, what you're saying here really makes a lot of sense. I mean, one thing people who don't know Scott Boris, we've certainly talked about your career, but he was a baseball player too. Yes, he, he played. At, I know he played at the University of Pacific, and I don't know if he played pro ball or not. But you know, he so he so he understands the game as a from the player side. But what what really impresses me about what you're saying, Mike, and this kind of goes back to your Fraser days, and the other guys you played for, being a top agent, quote unquote agent, you're really a top teacher. I mean, that's what it's really coming down to. You know, it's funny you say that because um, I never thought of Ron Frazier as a teacher, but now I look back, he was definitely a teacher. He was an educator. Skip Bergman, big educator. Um, and, you know, I didn't mention this earlier, and I think it's worthy of mentioning, was that Skip was the head coach of the 96 Olympic team. And even though I wasn't a player, I was in my my title as associate director, general manager of the team. I learned a lot from Skip that summer. I spent a lot of time with Skip that summer. And he is definitely an educator. Uh, Ron Polk, definitely a teacher. Uh, Dave Bingham, um, Mark Marquis. Um, these men, I can't even begin to tell you the influence that they've had, but teaching people about themselves, getting them, you know, they're all great baseball guys and they all had, they all really had great, drive and attitude and commitment to themselves. But that's the takeaway that I get from them. Like I, I tell people, even in my job today, I wish I had a, I had a PhD in psychology because that's what you're dealing with every day. You're dealing with people. And when you deal with people, you, you have to understand them. And you have, how do you, how are you going to find ways to get them or get to them, to be able to talk to them and be able to walk down the walk with them. And, uh, and that's what, that's what I really take away from all those great college coaches that I had. Um, you know, there were, uh, 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 I'm trying to remember the guy, the coach I had up in uh, Alaska, he was a Cal guy too. And, you know, uh, everywhere along the line, they're all great teachers and they're teaching you at least about you, but you don't know it at the time because you're so wrapped up in trying to perform and do all the things. But when you step back, I think about the influences of Bob Milano or, or, or Mark Marquis or Dave Bingham or Rich Alday or um, Ron Frazier, you know, people that touched me and had these foundational things that gave me a little bit um, and understood about what it took to not only win, but be prepared, uh, deal with failure and deal with all the things that go along with being in the baseball world, because it's not as simple of, of just having talent to win and you fall back. So Darbs, I, I don't think you could say it any better. The people, they are all teachers. And, you know, I, I didn't think of Ron Frazier as a teacher at the time, but I look back on him now and think, man, he was the great, one of the greatest professors I've ever had. But, but it seems to me that's why you guys are so successful at your business. Is that your teachers to your players? Yeah. Lending perspective for sure. I will say this, I'm going to say this, and, and I hope you, 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 you'll, you'll know what I'm saying. My colleagues at, at, at this company, at the Boris Corp, are exceptional. And uh, all of them could be, you know, they could go out on their own and do whatever they want to do. 
Um, they're exceptional people and have been around baseball a long time. Um, I've been at this company for 23 years and I'm the youngest at the company as far as tenure. So um, I've learned a lot from the people that I work with. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the people that I work with. And, um, you know, that's why, you know, I think we're, we're blessed. We have a great group. We have 140 employees that work at the Boris Corp. And, uh, you know, I, I just have a tremendous amount of respect to the people, how they commit themselves to the people that we represent. That's awesome. Um, let's, let's get into what's going on right now. I mean, the, the MLB, you know, usual big week of activity in December, the winter meetings obviously didn't happen this year with the pandemic and whatever, but this is usually the, the hot stove time of year, as the media likes to say. Um, we're not seeing a lot of activity right now in, in, in guys signing. Last year, you know, it, it was hot and heavy and we had a lot of big stuff happen again. But prior to that, you know, the couple of years before it was kind of slow again. What are you guys seeing? What's the state of the business and the health of baseball coming out of the pandemic? It was great. We got a season. Where are we on that front? And what, how are you guys advising your players right now? And what, what are we looking forward to? I think we have a lot to look forward to. Um, I think professional baseball has, has a lot to look forward to. Look, you know, 2020 is a, is, was, a, was a challenging year for many people, but the reality is we had a full season, uh, albeit, albeit it'd be 60 games, and that was more about the business of baseball than it was anything. But look, if you look around the league and you look around the Mets, as an example, just sold for $2.4 billion dollars. Uh, prior to that, the Dodgers were the were you know the highest uh, fr franchise bought at two billion, and uh, so you, if baseball wasn't successful, why would you you know why would you be buying a major league franchise in the middle of a pandemic if you didn't think that things would be good? That's one example. The other example that I will give you, as far as the state and health of baseball, is um, you know you look around all these developments uh, around ballparks that are going on. Owners are investing in their ballparks. So they, they wouldn't be doing that if they didn't think there was going to be, um, you know, obviously baseball in the years to come. Um, I'm not saying 2021 doesn't have its challenges. It does. But I believe fully that you will see, um, you know, some of the uncertainty you may see now, and I wouldn't even call it uncertainty, lack of movement, if you will, has to do with they're waiting to see what the season looks like. And I believe uh, when it's all said and done that, uh, we'll be closer to 162 games a full season um, and uh, than we were at 60 games. So, you know, uh, we, we went through a pandemic. We were able to do it safely. We crowned a champion. And um, there's, there's a lot of positive things moving forward in 2021. The vaccine, and again, not get off the rails too much here, but that's a positive thing uh, as, as Americans get vaccinated and, and you find uh, ways to treat this virus. I think you're going to see more people, people in the stands and, uh, and moving back towards um, some continuity of what we used to have. Now, that being said, there's a collective bargaining agreement coming up in 2022. And uh, so those are some issues that have to be resolved and, and, and work through. But I believe that uh, the ability for the players and the owners to be able to get together and uh, solve those issues uh, while they're, while they're challenging, we'll, we'll, we'll forge ahead and, and, and make sure that um, baseball's it, it, it will be will be advancing in the, after that. So, I, look, I'm I'm in, I'm encouraged. Uh, it it doesn't you know we we played baseball last year you know again 60 game schedule, but I feel confident that in 2021 we're moving towards the right method here, and that's 162 games. How many uh, how many of your guys' clients are are currently free agents and and are eligible and all that stuff. And, and when do you think we're going to start? I know you said we're waiting for some information on the season, but are you guys actively involved in discussions or everything's looking positive? You know, the, we, all that stuff will get done before spring training, hopefully. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, arbitration is a different animal than free agency. So there's right. just different right structure, but um, free agent, we have, we have a great class of free agents and, uh, I am encouraged by all the dialogue that we're having with clubs and and how that's going to you know play out over the course of uh, the next month, six weeks or so. And uh, there's not uh, 
I have no hesitation whatsoever about what the market will bear for these guys and what it means. You got to remember that um, this is a demand driven business. It's a, uh, it's a business that needs players. Um, you can have the greatest uh, players. And again, you can have the greatest draft picks in the world, but last year there was only five rounds. So you have to get the players somewhere. And um, you know, um, until I think everybody knows what the season will look like um, and what that means, but I have no reservations whatsoever. Our free agent class will all be placed and placed properly and all have homes and, and, and doing well into the 2021 season. And of course, arbitration follows that, but that's a little bit different than a free agent contract because in free agency, you can talk, you can talk to anybody in arbitration. It's a unilateral market and you cannot. But you do feel from a timing perspective, as Callan was saying that we're pretty much on track. We're on track. Yeah. I mean, uh, absolutely on track for um, not only for free agency arbitration, but the rest of, you know, the next year going into the draft. I mean, the, the timetable of what baseball is going to represent, at least at the major league level is on track uh, to move forward. And I don't, see, I don't see any hurdles stopping that. Well, like you said, with the pandemic and with the, with the vaccines, you know, it's nice to be thinking forward to something to look forward to. Well, you know, you know, you know, Darbs. I, I, again, you know, I'm not a medical doctor, and you know, I only, you know, obviously uh, know what I read about certain things as it relates to what we all do. But um, you know, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about where we go and what we do. Um, the great game of baseball, um, you know, I think really uh, showed a lot of people that could be done. I mean, it's it, it's never fun playing in empty stadiums, and I get that. And uh, I think to the players' measure, they didn't particularly like it, and I know. Probably ownership doesn't like it, but the reality is that we played the games and the economic feasibility of, of what um, TV means to us, uh, to our sport, and what's dr what drives uh, the big engine of, of our sport is television. And uh, so they were able to do that. And, um, you know, the pandemic set us back a little bit, but I, 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 don't, I don't envision those, those same issues coming to the forefront uh, in 2021. And matter of fact, I, you know, I feel optimistic. I do. There's a lot of uh, remedies on, on how we mitigate some of the virus and the effects it has on people, not only with the vaccine, but some of the treatments that are coming out. So, you know, there's more and more, I think, better news on the horizon than bad news on the horizon. Yeah. yeah at least we have some good news and this is part of it. Yep. Mike, I want to thank you for your time. I, I want to ask one more question and, and we've kept you a long time, but um, a lot of our listeners probably, um, you know, you made the comments, the differences between free agency and, and arbitration and arbitration being a little bit more one sided with the CBA coming up in 2022. I, I got to believe one of the big discussions is going to be, you know, how long teams have have control over players right now in the current climate. What is your what is your take on on that? And. If that's not a big issue, and, and I'm speaking a little bit naively here, but but what are going to be the key points as we come out of the pandemic with the players and the owners and what's going to drive that CBA? I mean, sometimes I feel personally it's like a little unfair that teams get so much control over those players for, for such a long time. And then, like you said, you, you might not be able to even make money till you're 30. Is, is that a big thing? Is How are people looking ahead beyond the pandemic to, to grow the game and, and keep the unity of baseball going? You know, as, as you move forward and you always, you always want to look at, you know, how the, the league or, or what the issues are that are surrounding the league and how it's affecting, you know, obviously from my standpoint or the company standpoint or, or, you know, working for players, how does it affect them? And what, what are the issues that are affecting them? But, um, I think service time is will certainly be uh, a discussion point um, in how that's structured. Uh, right now, you need in order to be arbitration eligible, you have to have you know the team when you sign when you sign a minor league contract when you sign a draft contract or when you sign the, the team owns your rights for essentially thirteen years. So seven in the minor leagues, six in the major leagues, and those clocks, you know, basically run independent of each other. So. Um, not exclusively, but essentially. And so your major league clock is different than your minor league clock. So, it, you know, when you come to the big leagues, the team owns your rights for six years and uh, they have to pay you the minimum. All they have to do is pay you the minimum for the first three years. 
And after the first three years, then you're arbitration eligible. And after years three, four, and five, you become a free agent. But as I, we mentioned before, most people don't even get to that mark because, you know, you know, just the, this, the way the system is set up and injury and again, malperformance takes players out of the game. So the reality is, is that for the first three years, the t- all the team has to do is pay you the minimum salary. And then, um, but you know, can you imagine being a, a, a high school player who signed and has no college education? The minimum is a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. But the reality is it's not a lot if you have to have it for 30 years. So the economic equations of what arbitration would mean to a player after three years, the player could get, get his contract evaluated by an independent source if the team and the player can't come to an agreement. And then of course, getting a player to free agency, you know, that's, that's totally different. I mean, it's six years, it's six years. So while I think there'll be a myriad of issues on the table, certainly service time will be looked at and it'll be examined. I'm sure by the union and, and others uh, that will find if, to see if this is an issue. But I think there are other economic issues that are on the table for the players too. Um, the luxury tax, um, draft compensation, um, you know, guys get, get hit with, um, you know, di- different um, s- scenarios that that prohibit actual tr- free movement. I mean, you know, if you get uh, you, the luxury tax as an example, uh, only incrementally went up in the draft in the last um, in the last agreement. So this agreement, I think that'll be on the table. I think service time will be in the table, and then compensation to to back to clubs with um, you know the qualifying offer will be looked at. Um, I'm sure there'll be there'll be a lot of different economic issues that that will be looked at, and, and I think then you'll see some things that are on on field issues that that want to be negotiated, uh, whether it's how you know, they play extra innings or uh, strike zones. Um, you know, all these things have to kind of be talked about and and vetted out. And uh, I'm sure MLB has some of the things that they may want to look to to change, and the union will have some things that the players will want to change. So, you know, it's it's you know. The budding of those heads, and as you as you both know, you know the acrimony that has uh, ensued over many many years between management and labor um, has not always been the best. And you hope that uh, as we go through this, um, the game's healthy. And how do we how do we figure out a way to keep make sure the game continues to be healthy, and but also reward the people that are actually participating in it. Yeah, and we're going to really need this game. Once we get this all behind us. So one last point, and I'll leave you on this. Um, one last point. It's a service driven business service, meaning service and time. So for a player, you know, to get service and, and, uh, and performance, it's, it, it, that's what drives the business. So that's the system we work in. And I think, you know, we'll see if, the, if, if major changes are coming, but, you know, baseball has been very efficient over the course of, you know, decades. And we want to continue that way. We want to make sure as the revenues grow, those revenues are, are, are valued for both sides and, uh, and rewarded for both sides. So, but I also want to thank you both. Um, you know, uh, I really appreciate the forum to be able to get on here and talk a little bit about my career. As I mentioned to you both earlier, um, playing uh, at the University of Miami, uh, college baseball, and then, of course, uh, playing in the College World Series, uh, three out of the four years I was at school, and then to play in international baseball and represent this greatest country, uh, the United States, and then won a gold medal. One of the proudest moments of my life to stand up on the, on the platform and get a gold medal. Um, changed the course of my life in va- indefinitely. I can't even probably describe uh, along the way. And that's how important college baseball is to me. That's how important international baseball is to me. And frankly, I'm a blessed person. I've lived uh, a lot of great uh, situations in my life. And I'm really, really, I want, I want people to know how thankful I am to have had the opportunities that I've, I've had, because I've had some really great, wonderful opportunities. And, and, and I go back with Darbs a long way. And I really mean that. And I joke about this bat, but that bat did do a lot for my career. <laughs> and I, I want you to know that it was Jim Darby that was able to do that for me. And well, you're, you're kind, Mike. And, it, and I'm a lucky guy because I've got a chance to see you through all these years. And I'm really proud of you for what you've accomplished in your career. And I know you're going to keep accomplishing these great things. So, buddy, it was great having you on the show. 
thank, thanks for having me guys and happy holidays to both of you and, and uh, nothing but the best in 2021. And I know we'll, we'll all catch up soon, but Dar you, I owe you a golf game. So we're, we're going to, we're going to do that in 2021. And, and, but Callan gets no strokes. He's too good. No, 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 no strokes. I'm getting yeah, strokes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the old guy in the group. I'm getting the strokes. Okay. Yeah. You and me both against him. I'll tell you. Uh, uh, well, thanks Mike for coming on. It just, um, what we're trying to do with this show is just, um, you know, unify people through baseball and share these different experiences. And it, the game of baseball is so much bigger than all of us. So just to, to hear everybody's story and, and get their insights, it's, it's just really, it's really exciting. And it's interesting every, every single time. And, um, you know, as much as you and I talk, it's just always great to hear the stories and, and, um, yeah. So thank you so much for coming on. Have a great holiday. Be safe. Be healthy. And here we come, 2021. Can't wait, guys. Thanks again. Thanks, Mike. Take care, buddy. Happy holidays to you. Happy holidays. Uh, another great show today. Uh, just awesome to catch up with, with Mike Fiore and just hear about his history and relationship in the game. And, and just also great to hear about the state of the game now from a business as aspect and where we're going. But uh, just always a fun time on the Right Off the Bat podcast, which is an Easton original production. The show is produced by Connor McGlynn. Yeah, once again, really big thanks to Mike Fiore. You can check us out on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcasts. And, and Darbs, thanks again, as always. Um, any closing thoughts? Any closing thoughts from your end? It, it, it was great to see Mike um, talking to us about so many aspects of the game today, all the way from his early playing days right through to where we are now. Hopefully, uh, getting his perspective on, you know, that we're going to have a successful 2021 season. So it was very enlightening. Yeah, it was great. Darbs, as always, great talking with you. We'll wish everybody happy holidays and, uh, I think we're going to see everybody again and talk to everybody again in 2021. So enjoy. Thanks.